Good morning uh, and good afternoon, everyone joining us today. We here at Faskin want to thank you for coming in with us uh, online uh, again from coast to coast uh, on our, today's subject, which is temporary help and temporary foreign workers, the legal landscape in 2024. This webinar is uh, scheduled for early this year, uh, just because we know that these issues right now are in the forefront uh, of a lot of folks' minds, that there are new requirements coming in specifically in Ontario that we want to touch on. And though they are not part of the regime of using temporary help workers uh, in other provinces, uh, there is uh, always reason to believe that other provinces are looking at the first mover uh, on any new rules. Plus, we know right now the, the use of temporary foreign workers uh, and looking at your own workforces and supplementing your own workforces or finding other workplace solutions, that this is top of mind for everyone as we start the year. Uh, and so I wanted to bring you these subjects early on so that you can be prepared uh, and have a refresher really on what you have to do, whether you operate a temp help agency, whether you use uh, temp, temp help agency workers, uh, or whether you've got plans to use temporary foreign workers at any time. Now look, while I introduce myself and our speakers, I'd like you to take a look at the information on the slide on your screen. Uh, in particular, uh, please note that there'll be a survey uh, at the very end of our presentation. We really, really value your feedback. So if you could take some time after we finish today to provide us some feedback, some thoughts on our content and some thoughts on uh, what you'd like to see coming up later in the year, uh, we would sincerely appreciate it. Now, uh, my name is Mark Rodrigue. Uh, I'm a partner at, in Faskin's Labor, Employment and Human Rights Group here in Toronto. I work, uh, of course, uh, with clients from many different sectors. I work with folks who run temporary help agencies and folks who use temporary help agencies, uh, both in the union and non-union context. And it's really my pleasure to be joined today by two of my fantastic uh, colleagues, uh, both associates at the firm. Uh, Stephanie Heinsen Spiropoulos is a lawyer in the Labor, Employment and Human Rights Group in Montreal. Uh, she specializes in the fields of economic immigration and labor mobility across Canada and advises clients on a broad range of complex immigration law matters, uh, working with multinational corporations, small businesses and individuals, assisting them with their immigration uh, and legal needs. That includes working with folks dealing with temporary foreign worker issues. Uh, I'm also joined uh, by our colleague Shakila Salam. She's an associate in the Labor and Employment and Human Rights Group here in Toronto as well. And in fact, right behind me, uh, behind this wall in the office next door. Shakila has a broad practice uh, working both in the union and non-union context, including with folks who are operating temporary help agencies uh, and who use temporary help agency uh, workers. Uh, and I'm very pleased that Shaquille is joining us. This is the first time that you will see her on one of our webinars, but certainly not the last that she'll be presenting with the Faskin team. Now on to our presentation, the uh, agenda of which you'll see right on your screen right now. We've got a lot of subject matter to cover, and you'll find that we've broken this down basically into two halves of a presentation. In our first half, we're going to discuss uh, temporary help agencies and, and use of temporary help agencies. Throughout, you'll see the acronym THA, Temporary Help Agency, uh, to help you uh, follow along on that. We may use Temp Help Agency, we may use THA. It's a mouthful to keep saying Temporary Help Agencies, I'll tell you. So uh, if we use THA, that's what we mean. Uh, we want to focus in particular for those operating in Ontario or thinking about operating in Ontario about some new requirements that are coming in halfway through the year, what that means for you. Uh, we'll also do a, a quick roundup of what else uh, exists for uh, regulation for temporary help agencies from coast to coast. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the, the risks, some of the pitfalls, uh, you know, in the what is a, a tripartite relationship when you have a temp help agency, a client and an employee uh, and what that may mean for you. And in particular, what that may mean for you if you operate in the unionized context. From there, we're going to move on to the temporary foreign workers uh, immigration requirements. Uh, this uh, certainly adds another layer of issues, uh, especially if you're going to use folks provided through a temporary help agency, or if you're operating a temporary help agency that uses temporary foreign workers. 
So you'll have, uh, we'll have Stephanie present uh, in the second half of the presentation on those issues for us. A great reminder uh, in particular of what you have to deal with. Now, if, if we do nothing else today, um, uh, but convince you of three things, we'll be very happy. If you are in Ontario and you operate a temp help agency, you have to apply for your license uh, with the government of Ontario before July 1st. If you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember that and get started on your application. If you use temp help agencies in Ontario, make sure that you're doing your diligence and the temp help agencies that you use are either licensed or they have applied for their license by July 1st of this year. And I think it goes without saying, if you are going to uh, employ temporary foreign workers, whether that's through an agency or directly in what you do, remember this, just make sure you are in compliance uh, with all of the requirements that Stephanie will go through with us uh, later in the presentation. If you can remember those three things, this is an hour to an hour and a half well spent. Uh, on to the next slide. So let's first turn to Ontario. Next slide. From, uh, from an Ontario perspective, the government here in the province has long been interested in, in temporary help agencies, uh, their usage and their regulation. Folks who've been involved with THAs or using THAs for years, you've known that in our employment standards legislation specifically, there are a lot of requirements that are specifically focused uh, at THAs. We'll go through some of them. We won't go through all of them today, uh, but there'll be some refreshers uh, once we talk about these new requirements. And, uh, you know, there's there's always been uh, a, some, some level of uh, commitment from the Ministry of Labor or focus to look at THAs uh, and their relationship with employees. Why? Well, uh, it, it, there have uh, been many, many high profile cases <clears throat> involving THAs where employees have come to the forefront and complained about not being paid. Uh, if we look to, I believe just last year, the ministry found about $4 million uh, owed to about 10,000 employees who were THA employees. Uh, and there are many great employers in this space. I know I work with many of them, uh, but there are some that are getting unfair advantage in the industry by, you know, operating you know, fly by night uh, operations where they're, they're using employees, making a dollar and disappearing. And in those circumstances, of course, the ministry is, uh, is quite upset and, and uh, makes efforts to collect, including sometimes collect against clients who use the THAs in the first place. So we want to, you know, keep in mind through all of this that if we are operating THAs, if we're going to use THAs, the spotlight is going to be there. It has been for some time. So, uh, and again, last year, uh, and, and these stats are probably uh, underrepresented, <clears throat> uh, but Ontario estimates that there were about 2,300 temporary help agencies in Ontario alone last year and over 100,000 workers. Uh, in this sector. So it, it's, a, uh, it's a comprehensive sector touching across many, many industries in the province. Back in 2021, when the Ford government introduced multiple changes uh, to our Employment Standards Act, uh, they also introduced what is our topic today, new licensing requirements for both recruiters, not just THAs, but recruiters who recruit employees or employers and temporary help agencies those were meant to come into force originally uh, January 1 of this year to provide some extra time uh, for folks to get used to the new regime, to apply and to meet the requirements. It has been pushed back to July 1st of this year. It's a fairly easy process, but with some requirements we'll talk to. Uh, although I will say it, <clears throat> the system, which is an online uh, application system to get a license, is a little mucked up right now or even before this call i checked the online system and it's down for maintenance or at least it says so currently so keep if you've got it bookmarked keep refreshing it every day if you're trying to get uh your license in before july 1st uh, but ultimately the new requirements are going to be come july 1st 
if you're operating a THA, you need to be licensed uh, by the province of Ontario if you're going to work here under provincial jurisdiction, which will be most uh, folks who operate THAs. It also means that clients who use THAs are going to be required to make sure or do their own due diligence that the THA is licensed. And if they fail to do that and knowingly use a THA that is not licensed, they can face penalties. So as a client, we can face penalties on this. Uh, and there will be, to help us with this, on both sides of the equation, there will be a database available online. Once licenses are issued, you can check the database, see if the THA you're going to use is licensed, uh, and you should do your due diligence to make sure. Uh, on to the next slide, please. So the process, again, as we said, was supposed to come in, or the requirements were supposed to be effective January 1. Licensing was open you know, about six months before that, starting July 1st of last year. I know many folks have already applied for their licenses. Uh, there, again, you've got until June 30th this year, if, unless you want to face repercussion, and we'll talk to that. If you're operating a THA, you need to apply for the license. You need to go through that process. You need to provide the pieces required to be licensed into the government. And if you've done that, you can continue to operate past July 1, even if you're not licensed, so long as you've put your application in. You should keep a record of that, of course, because anyone who wants to hire you may be asking you to prove that you're allowed to operate. And you can show that if you've applied and you haven't received a response yet about your license. If you do not apply as a THA by July 1st of this year, you cannot, it will be against the law, against the ESA in Ontario to operate past July 1 unless you've applied for the license. So if you're using THAs, again, you better make sure that your THAs have applied for their license. And if they don't, the consequence is it becomes legal for you to use them. You put your, your organization at risk of a fine if you use a THA and you know they don't have a license and have not applied for it by July 1st. Uh, you'll note here too, if you're operating, we won't speak to it much, but if you're operating a recruiting agency, there are gonna be some exemptions uh, as well. Those uh, certain recruiters working for unions, registered charities and government are exempt from the new rules. Again, not just THAs, but recruiters need to be licensed by July 1 too. On to the next slide, please. So <clears throat> what do you need to give to the government uh, under this new regime if you're a THA? You're going to need to give your business address, uh, your email, your telephone number, no surprise uh, there. Uh, they're going to need contact information uh, for whom they can contact uh, with respect to the application. And there will be a, a renewal process. I'll talk to that in a second as well. There's a $750 fee. Uh, for looking for, for getting the license, but there is also a requirement that you provide uh, essentially a letter of credit of $25,000 to the Ministry of Labor. That, uh, you know, it, it's, it's fairly easy to tell what's going on here, I think, in terms of why the government's requiring a $25,000, uh, you know, upfront uh, credit. It's that in case we end up in a scenario where employees aren't paid, in case you know the, there's the experience of the THA disappearing, there's something, there's some money at hand that can be accessed to pay employees and other liabilities. So again, uh, it, it may be onerous depending on the size of your THA, uh, but there is a requirement to put up some security uh, going forward if you wanna continue operating. Uh, there's a requirement as well to verify your tax compliance status. And not only that, and this is a this is a bit of an information gathering step for the ministry. If you are a THA and you use THAs to supplement your own workforce or to get them to clients, there are disclosure requirements around that as well, or recruiters. You are meant to disclose who they are, how to contact them, where they are, uh, what they do to the ministry with your application. Now, again, I think that that probably will help the ministry track down additional THAs, and that is the purpose. 
of that, but know that it's not just information about your own organization that you may need to give in the event you also use THAs uh, or supply clients with THAs, not just directly through your own operations, but su subcontracting essentially to other THAs. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to all this, of course, uh, there is going to be additional information about making sure you're in compliance uh, and registered if you need to be with the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board. You're up to date with WSIB so that that, that can be cross-referenced. Uh, whether you've been refused a license to operate a THA or to operate as a recruiter in another Canadian jurisdiction. Uh, whether there are any criminal convictions uh, or Immigration and Refugee Protection Act uh, convictions or compliance issues with your organization, uh, and whether or not there are any um, uh, bans issued to your directors or officers under the Ontario Immigration Act, and if so, how long that ban is. Again, you can you can see from what you've probably seen in the news uh, or heard in, in terms of high-profile cases, what the ministry uh, has focused on in terms of the rules, what information they're looking for. Uh, you know, this is whether it's, you know, using temporary foreign workers and taking advantage of temporary foreign workers or there are other uh, significant compliance or criminal issues with your organization. Uh, the ministry is looking for that. Uh, and that is informed, I think, in part by the cases we've all seen come through the media at times. On to the next slide, please. Now. The ministry doesn't have to give a license. Uh, it has some discretion. Now, it, you know, given the information it needs, I think we can evaluate, at least in the early stages, what sort of answers it's looking for in terms of issuing a license. But if it turns down an application for license, it will notify uh, you. Uh, and uh, there is a, a process <clears throat> by which you can appeal the decision by going to the Ontario Labor Relations Board. It's essentially an appeal. Uh, and there are some rules around operating in this period once you know that you've been denied. Uh, now, again, you can continue going for another 30 days uh, once your license has been refused or revoked or suspended. Uh, and after that 30 days, um, you know, the, all the rules about not having a license will kick in subject to the appeals process. Now, you may ask, you know, okay, so if I have a license, you know, how often am I going to have to do this? And how often am I at risk of a license refusal? Well, as of right now, the legislation contemplates that licenses will be for one year. So annually, you will need to go through the license renewal process as of now. Uh, so keep keep tabs on that. It will have to form part of your annual administrative uh, efforts to keep that license fresh. And now what does that mean, obviously, for your THA? You, you've got to put the effort in. If you use THAs, especially if you've got a long-term relationship with a temporary help agency, uh, you're going to want to make sure that in your contracts with the temporary help agency, or at least in your expectation setting, that you're reminding them that they need to keep the licenses up to date every year that you that you know I, I think at the end of the day we'll see the burden on the THA to do that of course uh, but if you're using THAs make sure that you set that expectation out whether that's in a communication whether that's in the contract uh, as you're as the lawyer here I would say it's always best to put it in the contract if you can but keep this in mind going forward that this is going to be an annual thing now if you have your license uh, revoked or you have your license refused it is going to be consequential. You know, you, you're not going to be able to operate your THA uh, in compliance with the law in Ontario. And there is a two year cooling off period. So for two years, you're not going to be able to apply for a license from there. Again, this is going to have obviously significant impacts on your operations uh, and, and what you do going forward. On to the next slide, please. So what happens if we decide we're going to use a THA even though we know they don't have a license? Well, as a client, there are potential penalties uh, for that. The penalties uh, include and can include fines, fines against the company, you know, in, in the worst case scenario or in worst case scenarios, there could be additional fines uh, against directors. 
Uh, but the current regime on fines against the company, for example, contemplates a, a fine that would grow. If you, you know, for your first offense, it could be up to a certain level. Second, growing. Third, growing within a certain time frame. Right now, the steps go from fifteen thousand dollars in terms of a fine to twenty-five to fifty. Uh, so it escalates, and if you keep getting caught using THAs, it will escalate quickly. And I will tell you from experience, if uh, and this is experience uh, being a, a staffer inside the Ministry of Labor and the minister's office, if if you get caught breaching the the act, particularly with respect to THAs and THA employees, I would expect you to be on a short list of uh, organizations that the the ministry will keep tabs on. So. If you've been visited once uh, and you found a contravention, expect further visits. Um, now, again, as we said, if by July 1st, your THAs have put in for their license, but they haven't had their license issued yet or no decisions come from the ministry, you can still use them. THAs can still operate. If you're the THA, make sure you keep a record of your application so that you can provide it to clients. Uh, clients, make sure that you're looking for that uh, to make sure that you can use the THA. Now, interestingly, if you're using a THA or you're operating a THA and your license gets revoked, it is unlikely that, and so you're stuck with a whole bunch of employees employed by the THA that you as a THA can no longer employ because you can't operate and clients cannot use you. Well, it is going to be extremely difficult, we think, for you to argue that there is a, there's a frustration of employment and you don't owe folks uh, if you have to terminate their employment. Most of the folks that you're employing at that point as THA employees, you're going to have to terminate. And that's going to be costly for you as a THA operating and employing those folks. And it could be costly in case there's any costs foisted onto the client by operation of the ESA, there's certain costs, Shaquille will go through, that can be foisted onto a client if the THA fails to pay up. So some significant repercussions. You want to make sure you're compliant. You want to make sure you stay on the good side of, uh, of the Ministry of Labor and you're not uh, a highlighted or spotlighted THA. And you can do that by getting proactive now in these six months. Almost, It's less than six months, so five months and one week. Uh, that you can get your license in uh, and go through the process uh, prior to July 1. Okay, on to the next slide, please. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna pass this on to Shaquilla at this point, and she'll talk a little bit about uh, outside of Ontario and other uh, temporary assignment employee issues. And, and as we, we move off of the, 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 the things that are coming down the pike on July 1, for Ontario, let's keep in mind, you know, temporary help agencies and temporary help agency employees. Who are we talking about? With respect to Ontario, for example, there's a there's a definition uh, in our Employment Standards Act. Of course, we're talking about uh, agencies that employ employees and deploy them to clients uh, to work at client premises or on client projects, uh, and that's the business model. Uh, and of course, you know, the, there are lots of classic examples that we know of, lots of industries where temporary help agencies will supply labor on, on short-term bases to supplement our workforce, whether it's seasonal or in a pinch. Uh, but a, a couple things to keep in mind uh, that, that may surprise you in terms of temporary help agencies. There's no definition for what temporary really means, at least in Ontario, how long a temporary help employee can be assigned to a client. And we know that, uh, you know, in Ontario and across the country, there are uh, a, a rising number of what I'll call uh, employers of record, uh, where uh, there's an organization that exists to uh, hire and then and be the employer and essentially deploy uh, employees to a client uh, who doesn't have operations or a set business uh, in Canada. I would say arguably in Ontario, those employers of record are temporary help agencies. They exist to supply labor to a client, even if uh, when we talk about temporary, there's no end date for that assignment. Uh, the idea being that the, the employer of record stays the employer means that we could be caught here uh, in terms of being a, a temporary help agency, at least for Ontario purposes. So whether you're in a, a more classic model 
or whether you operate an employer of record model, keep in mind that these obligations are coming up and there are other things to consider across the country. So uh, with that, over to Shaquilla. Thanks so much, Mark. So I'm briefly going to walk you through some of the temp help agency legislation that we have outside of Ontario, and then touch on a few pitfalls and compliance risks that um, employers should be aware of if they choose to work with temp help agencies. Next slide, please. So just a coast to coast overview, there are licensing requirements currently established in Alberta, British Columbia, and Quebec. And as Mark um, previously mentioned, Ontario's is starting on July 1st and applications need to be submitted by June 30th of this year. These licensing requirements are typically um, involving app an application, a standard application, a fee, as well as a screening process. Um, and it is best practice to make sure that if you are choosing to work with a temp agency, um, make sure that that agency is complying with the respective licensing laws in the jurisdictions where licensing laws are in place. Next slide, please. So we're going to go through some risks and other key requirements to keep in mind if you are choosing to work with a temporary help agency. Next slide. So the ESA has provisions that govern the use of temporary help agencies and recruiters, and that can be found under part 18.1 of the ESA. Where an employer enters into an agreement with a temporary help agency or, an, or a recruiter, the employer becomes a client of that temp help agency or recruiter. The employee who is assigned to perform work for the client becomes an assignment employee. And under the ESA, assignment employees generally have the same rights as other employees of the client employer. There are also specific rules under the ESA that apply specifically to assignment employees, uh, specifically under Section 74 of the ESA. And there are also obligations that clients have to their assignment employees as well. On to the next slide, please. So as Mark pre previously touched on, an employer of the assignment employee is the employer of the assignment employee. And typically the temp help agency is liable for any unpaid wages to the assignment employee. However, there is an obligation to clients of a temp help agency that could be found under part 74 sub one of the ESA, such that if the temp help agency for some reason doesn't pay their assignment employee, the client could be on the hook for any unpaid wages owed to the assignment employee. In other words, the client could be held jointly and severally liable with the temp, temp help agency for some or all of unpaid wages to an assignment employee. Next slide, please. If you are looking to work with a temp help agency or are currently working with one, it's important to keep track and maintain your records for at least three years in case there is a sudden inspection by an employment standards officer. So what you should keep track of is the name of all the assignment employees that you are currently working with and the number of hours they each work in per day and as well as every week. And again, you should be keep holding on to these records for at least three years in case there is an inspection. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through a few potential pitfalls that you should be aware of if you are planning on working with a temp help agency or currently working with one. The first of those, is the true and common employer issue that sometimes arises. So using a temporary help agency does create a tripartite relationship between the assignment employee that is assigned to your workplace to perform your work, the temporary help agency itself, and the client employer. 
As a client employer, you should be aware of risks when soliciting the services of a temporary help agency to avoid running into the risk of a related or true employer relationship. And in Ontario, the use of temporary help agencies does not automatically shield client employers from obligations to their assignment employees. As I previously mentioned, you could be on the hook for unpaid wages in case the temporary help agency chooses or decides not to pay their assignment employee. Next slide, please. An example of this could be found in Teamsters Local uh, 419 and Atlantic Sugar. So in this case, Teamsters had applied for a union certification application and the union took the position that assignment truck drivers that were hired from a temporary help agency were part of their bargaining unit and that the employees of uh, the employer were um, were part of the um, that the temporary truck drivers were part of um, the employees of the employer Atlantic Sugar. The employer and the temporary help agency who intervened in this application for certification argued that the assignment truck drivers were in fact not employees of Atlantic Sugar, but rather employees of the temp help agency itself. The Ontario Relations Board found against Atlantic Sugar and found that the assignment truck drivers were in fact part of the bargaining unit. And in coming to its decision, the Ontario Labor Relations Board considered a few of the following factors that you can see on the screen before you. They looked at who exercised the direction and control over the employees. Was it the temp help agency or was it the client employer? Who carried the burden of remuneration? Who was disciplining the employees? Who was involved in the hiring? Who here had the authority to dismiss the employees? And they also looked to determine who was the perceived employer in this case, and whether or not there was an intention to create an employer-employee relationship. The Ontario Labor Relations Board said that this is actually a fact-specific analysis and that it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. While the factors on the screen before you are not exhaustive, the board considered the following facts. In this case, the employer controlled the day-to-day -day scheduling of the agency truck drivers, and the agency truck drivers called their Atlantic Sugar Manager their boss. While the temp help agency was responsible for assigning the truck drivers payroll, hiring them, and training them, the board ultimately determined that in this case, Atlantic Sugar, the client employee, exercised fundamental control. And that's why they found against the employer and considered the assigning truck drivers as part of the bargaining unit. Next slide, please. The approach that the Ontario Re Labor Relations Board initially expressed was initially expressed by the Supreme Court of Ontario in 1997 in the case of Point Claire and Quebec. In this case, the court said that it's essential that temporary employees be able to bargain with the party that exercises the greatest control over all aspects of their work, and not only over the supervision of their day-to-day -day work. This has to be a comprehensive and flexible approach. The court also provided a list of factors pertaining to what makes an employer-employee relationship, and this includes selection, process, hiring, training, discipline, evaluation, supervision, assignment of duties, remuneration, and integration into the business. These are similar factors that were considered by the Ontario Relations Board in Atlantic Sugar, as was expressed by the Supreme Court of Canada a few years back. Next slide, please. So if you are working with or plan to use the services of a temporary help agency as a unionized employer, it's also important to be aware of what type of work you are contracting out. Where there is clear language in your collective agreement that prohibits contracting out bargaining unit work, you are prohibited from subcontracting out any bargaining unit work to an assignment employee of a temporary help agency. Next slide, please. So 
So an example of this could be found in Gate Gourmet and Teamsters Local 647. In this case, the employer had laid off a group of its employees, 43 to be exact, and replaced them with personnel or assignment employees that it hired from a temporary help agency. The union, to no surprise, filed a grievance stating that the work that was contracted out was not bona fide and the employer remained the true employer of the assignment employees that were hired by the agency. Next slide, please. However, in this case, the arbitrator dismissed the grievance. Unlike Lantic Sugar, the arbitrator in this case found that the temporary help agency still remained the true employer of the assignment employees and that the client employer was not the one exercising fundamental control. The arbitrator considered the fact that the temporary help agency still maintained supervision on site of the client's premises on a 24 seven basis. Furthermore, the evidence established that the agency staff, not the employer, the client employer, directed and maintained control over virtually all of their assign, assignment employees' work. While the client employer was the one that was providing instructions to the assignment employees about the work that needed to be done and when it needed to be done by, it still left it up to the temporary help agency to organize amongst itself how they wanted to carry out the work. So it's important and the main distinguishing factor between this decision and Lantic Sugar is that in this case, the employer seemed to relinquish a little bit of the control and left it up to the temp agency about how it wanted to organize itself and divide up the work between the assignment employees. I'm now going to pass it over to my colleague, Stephanie, who's going to speak to you about the temporary foreign workers and other immigration requirements. Thanks, Shakila. So as Shakila explained, there are many pitfalls and risks in terms of compliance just when dealing with temporary help agencies more generally. Now for this next half of this presentation, what we'll, what we'll do is dive deep in, and understand the pitfalls and compliance risks when dealing with temporary help agencies that deal more specifically with temporary foreign workers. So in addition to the employment law risks, there are Canadian immigration law risks that come into play when um, the temporary help agencies that you're working with um, will uh, deploy temporary foreign workers. Next slide, please. So just before we discuss pitfalls and compliance risks, um, for those of you that are maybe not as familiar with the general immigration programs or work permit uh, programs that exist, there are two main programs um, to obtain a work permit for a foreign worker. Um, the first one and the most common one um, is the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. So um, this is the program whereby um, the employer needs to obtain an, a labor market impact assessment, commonly referred to as LMIA, before they can get the work permit and before they can hire the foreign worker. So whenever uh, you need to get an LMIA, um, this is uh, you using the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. And of course, whenever you need to get an LMIA to hire your foreign worker, um, these are only closed work permits. So it's never the case that you need an LMIA and the person also, uh, and that it will result in an open work permit. And it's exclusively closed work permit. In other words, the LMIA based work permit will always be tied to a specific employer, specific position, job title, work location. It's very, very uh, specific and limited to the employment terms that you have declared in the LMIA application. And these terms need to remain as they are for the entire duration of the employment period that you've asked for. So if you've asked for a temporary period of six months, then the terms and conditions of the employment need to remain the same for six months. And if it's a year, say, the same applies and so on and so forth. So for... Um, work permits, the maximum duration that someone can obtain a work permit for at a time is up to three years. It can be less, but that's the maximum. And then if you want to go beyond that, um, you need to apply to extend the work permit. 
So in Quebec, uh, for those of you that also have operations in Quebec and hire uh, foreign workers based in Quebec, in addition to the LMIA, uh, you also need to obtain a Quebec acceptance certificate, which uh, you apply for with Immigration Quebec. So it's a joint decision, both by Service Canada that renders the positive uh, or negative decision on the LMIA. Um, so there's an added layer uh, that Immigration Quebec is involved um, to also um, give their stamp of approval for you to hire a foreign worker, specifically under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. Uh, next slide, please. So I just included like um, um, just briefly so that you're aware that there are different LMIA streams. Um, there are six in total, but the most common that we see are high wage, low wage LMIA streams and also the global talent stream. They all are similar, but again, they all have their unique set of requirements and conditions. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, we've seen lately there's a lot of controversy uh, in the media and the news surrounding the temporary foreign worker program. Um, because, like I mentioned earlier, the temporary foreign wor worker program is designed for the work permits to be closed work permits. Um, so every work permit has a specific employer. It's tied to a specific employer, which leaves little flexibility for the foreign workers that are here to move from employer uh from one employer to the other especially in situations where you know um they're not happy or there's a better opportunity it's very it, it, it's limit it's limiting to the foreign worker that is a fact um however if there is an opportunity for a foreign worker um with another employer uh it, it you know it doesn't mean that they can't um you know undergo the process formally um and you know to obtain in a new LMIA or a new work permit with um, the new employer, so a new closed work permit. It, it does take you know some time. It's not instant as opposed to having an open work permit, but it is possible. Um, and in our opinion, you know, it's it's hard to state that um, you know some some of the criticisms that we've that that have been in the media are is that the temporary foreign worker program is sort of like a a modern form of slavery. Um, but it's hard to 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 see it that way, especially for us, because um, the temporary foreign worker program is very beneficial for many of our clients, especially in the context of the labor shortage crisis in Canada. Um, you know, there's a lot of vacant positions, there's a lot of urgent needs to fill these positions, and oftentimes, um, when there's no local workers available for these positions, um, you know, employers are happy to be able to turn to foreign workers. Um, you know, to 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 fill out these positions to to efficiently run their, their businesses and their operations. Um, and another thing to point out is that the temporary foreign worker program's core mission is to protect foreign workers and protect them against abusive employers, non-compliant employers, and they've developed um, a robust employer compliance regime where uh, employers are held liable for not, for you know for not respecting foreign workers for a non-fair treatment for not uh, providing them with their rights um that that you know that that are awarded to them through various canadian laws immigration laws employment laws and so on and so forth um and these employer compliance regimes are really um available whenever there is a closed work permit um, inspections can take place, random inspections where um, immigration authorities can go in person at the workplace. They can be uh, remote inspections too, where they ask for various documentation, uh, pay slips. They want photos of the workplace to make sure um, that the workplace is safe, that they're paying the wages that they're supposed to be paid. Um, also, uh, that there's health and safety standards in place, that there's, um, you know, policies against harassment in the workplace. All these things are verified, uh, by way of a robust employer compliance regime. Um, there is also, um, a possibility for foreign workers who feel that they have, that they're being abused or mistreated by their Canadian employers to apply for an open work permit for vulnerable workers. Um, and so this is another way that the government seeks to protect any foreign workers that are not being treated right through this uh, closed work per permit system. Um, and so this is not available whenever the foreign worker holds an open work permit 
And it's most definitely not available whenever the foreign worker fails to secure valid work authorization altogether. There's no recourse. Uh, well, there's limit. The recourses are much more limited and less, um, you know, less sophisticated. I would say. Next slide, please. So now we covered the temporary foreign worker program, which is one of the main programs available to get work permits for your foreign worker population. The other popular one is the international mobility program. So this one is for um, foreign workers who, who, because of various factors, their profile, the type of work that they're going to come do, um, they're exempt from the need for their employer to get an LMIA first. So you go straight um, into the work permit application because you're exempt from getting the LMIA first. And so as opposed to the temporary foreign worker program, the international mobility program has both closed and open work permit options. And they're often uh, related to economic, cultural or social advantages for Canada. Um, most of the time, international mobility work permits will be based on free trade agreements or other reciprocal international experience or exchange agreements that Canada has with other countries. It could be international uh, intracompany transfers or certain foreign workers that hold provincial nomination certificates or in Quebec, Quebec selection certificates. So this means that they're in process of applying for permanent residence. So there's special categories of work permits for them. Them, uh, which exempt them from LMIAs. Next slide, please. So now that we've covered very briefly the main ways to get uh, work permits for foreign worker populations, um, we're going to talk a little bit about temporary foreign workers and placement agencies and, you know, the added risks and pitfalls when dealing with placement agencies that specifically deal with foreign workers. Next slide, please. So, so what we see is that very often when employers hire temporary help, they will go through placement agencies and most of the time they will uh, send uh, foreign workers as temporary help. Um, and the, the key, the most important thing, whenever um, the temporary help agency that you're dealing with is offering to send over a foreign worker is ask for a copy of the foreign workers work permit before they start, before you accept the agreement for the temporary help it's very important that you ask for a copy and that you retain the copy. Um, similar to what my colleague Shakila mentioned earlier about document retention, there is a similar requirement under the immigration regulations. And it's not only for three years, it's actually for six years. Um, there is a tri tripartite uh, you know, relationship that is, is that is there, as mentioned by Shakila and Mark. Um, you know, it's not because you're dealing with a temporary help agency who, who's the, you know, the employer who is paying the foreign foreign worker that you're completely, you know, absolved from any responsibility as to um, the foreign workers legal authorization to work in Canada. Next slide, please. So due diligence obligation. So this is what I mean when um, I say it's really important to ask the temp help agency for a copy of the foreign workers work permit, you really want to make sure that before going any further, this person is legally authorized to work in Canada. And there is a due diligence obligation that's recognized under sections 124 and 125 of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Um, so as we can see here, um, you're in contravention of the act. Um, when you're a per every it says specifically every person commits an offense who employs a foreign national in a capacity in which the foreign national is not authorized under this act to be employed. So it's important to note that the act says every person um, who employs a foreign national, and it doesn't speak to whether the employment is direct or indirect. So this leads us to, to state that, you know, it's not because you're indirectly employing um, the foreign national, you're, you're not the official employer because the temp help agency is that you do not have a due diligence obligation, that you do not need to worry about whether or not this person is legally authorized authorized to work in Canada. There's also deemed knowledge under section 124.2, um, uh, sorry, deemed knowledge right under. So, you know, a person who fails to exercise due diligence to determine whether employment is authorized under this act is deemed to know that it is not authorized. So 
it's important that as the client employer who's receiving the foreign worker, that you have documented evidence that you've asked for a copy of the of the work permit and you keep a copy of it so that you can show that you have conducted your part of the due diligence obligation. Next slide, please. And again, um, it's it's also to avoid reputational risk. Um, you know, it's it's been really common now. We see it more and more in the media and the news. Um, the labor shortage crisis in Canada is ongoing. Um, it hasn't gone away, and there's more and more urgency to fill vacant positions. Uh, companies are relying more and more on recruitment and placement agencies to hire temporary help. Um, and because of the urgency, what we've noticed is that, you know, sometimes it's very punctual needs, very short term needs, maybe a few days, a few weeks. Um, and and because of, you know, because it's nerve wracking, you just really need to fill this position so that your business could run efficiently. Um, you know, the, the, the client employer sometimes will fail to verify the work authorization of the foreign workers. Um, so they're failing to conduct their due diligence. In other words, they're relying on the temp help agency. Um, you know, they're relying on the fact that they're saying, well, you know, um, I'm hiring this temp help agency. So I, uh, I trust that they've already conducted their due diligence and they're the employer. Um, so th it's, the, it's on them to check, you know, the, the work uh, authorizations. Um, but as we saw before, under section 124 of the Immigration Act, that's not the case. Um, and it could lead to unfortunate, um, you know, uh, situations and, um, you know, bad rap in the, in the media. Like we saw recently the class action lawsuit against Trésor, the placement agency in Quebec, um, and New Rest. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, uh, there was a situation where Trésor, the placement agency, uh, sent um, you know, hundreds of foreign workers to New Rest without legal authorization to work. So without work permits at all. Um, and uh, so now so now New Rest, which was the receiving company, the employer client um, is involved as well. And, you know, it's because New Rest is, you know, the the more renowned company, the, the you know, the, the, the spotlight is more on them as opposed to the small placement agency that's based in a small uh, city in uh, in Quebec, which is Trésor. So important to keep in mind in terms of reputational risk. So again, best practice, you know, before hiring, before uh, signing an agreement with a temp help agency, ask for the a copy of the work permit. Check the conditions of the work permit. Is it valid? It's not expired. Is it open? Is it closed? Is it tied to another employer? These are red flags. So make sure that you know, you're checking the work authorizations, you're checking the conditions on the work permit. And when in doubt, consult an immigration lawyer, um, ask the right questions, because it can have many consequences later in time that you would want to avoid. Next slide, please. So again, a, a question that comes up really often um, is the question on the difference between open work permits and closed work permits. So an ideal scenario for any employer, whether you're going through a placement agency or you're hiring the foreign worker yourself, um, is that the foreign worker comes to you with an open work permit already, uh, because this means that the foreign worker is in Canada and has the flexibility to work for the employer of their choice and the position of, the ch of their choice um, and the province of their choice. And, um, and most importantly as well, it doesn't require any sponsorship from a company, from an employer. So it's it's a much easy and faster process. They show you their valid open work permit, and then you know you, you do your, your usual formalities from an employment law perspective and you know other things that, that you should do in your HR process, but you don't need to apply for a work permit for them. Um, so examples of open work permits that you maybe have seen or you will see um, you know, uh, when you're when you're hiring a foreign worker. Are special humanitarian program open work permits, like the one that we saw for Ukrainian citizens fleeing the war. Those were very popular. A lot of um, companies were able to benefit from the expertise and, you know, manpower of Ukrainians here with open work permits without any, you know, complicated formalities to obtain any uh, work, closed work permits. Another common one is the working holiday work permit. Uh, where young professionals come to Canada for a vacation, but also um, have an open work permit so that they can gain work experience while here. 
Another one is the post-graduation work permit. So for international students who have graduated from a Canadian educational institution, um, oftentimes they will have an open work permit that will allow you to hire them right away. Um, open work permits for asylum seekers too. So refugee claimants that are waiting for their hearing, um, they will have open work permits as well. And then um, finally, there's the open work permits for, for vulnerable workers that I mentioned earlier. So um, if this is the case, these are just some examples of open work permits, then you know that, you know, you check the expiry date. If it's still valid, you know that there are no other formalities to get a closed work permit before you can hire them. Next slide, please. Uh, we can go to the next one. So one of the uh, other frequent questions that we get is, well, who needs to get the LMIA? Because I'm dealing with a temporary help agency and they're the employer. So shouldn't the temporary help agency get the LMIA? Um, and so this is not a straightforward answer. As we saw before, it's a tripartite relationship that is created between the temporary help agency, um, the, the cl client employer and the foreign worker. Um, and you know, there, there's the whole notion of the true and common employer that Shakila mentioned earlier. It also applies when you're dealing with foreign workers. Um, so there are several questions to ask before deciding who, who needs to get the LMIA, who needs or who, ne who needs to get the closed work permit. For example, who's benefiting from the services of the foreign worker? Who is paying the foreign worker? Who is directing the work and schedule of the foreign worker? And also another one that gets added is who is willing to be subject to employer compliance inspections and who is willing to be liable under the temporary foreign worker um, or international mobility program employer compliance regimes. Next slide, please. So in the end, the question is, can a recruitment or placement agency obtain an LMIA and then deploy the foreign worker to their client site? And so, Technically, it's not prohibited unless you're dealing with um, a job that's based in Quebec. We'll, we'll see that in a bit. Um, so it's a little bit different when dealing with the province of Quebec. But outside of Quebec, um, the agency can be the employer um, if, um, amongst other factors, the foreign worker will be on the payroll of the temporary help agency and the client sites or work locations uh, the position that the per that the foreign worker will will hold, essentially all the employment terms are known and declared in advance in the LMIA. Because as I mentioned earlier, an LMIA is specific to one location, one job title, um, you know, one uh, job description, and it can be changed throughout the entire period of employment of the LMIA based work permit. Um, so if these things are declared in advance and it's easy to do so and it's and it's, um, you know, it, it's not there's no there will be no surprises and no changes throughout the employment period of the foreign worker, then it makes sense. Um, also, th there should there should be an understanding from the temporary help agency that when you are going to be the named company in an LMI application, and a closed work permit, there are a set of requirements and obligations that you will need to abide by. Um, sometimes it's not easy to um, make sure that you will be found compliant um, in case of an inspection from immigration authorities. Um, you know, because so, for example, some of the requirements when being an employer, a named employer in an LMI application is to ensure that the uh, company where the employers were uh, the foreign workers working has a um, policy against harassment or it's a safe um, workplace that you know everything that's that involves you know health and safety standards are up to date if you're not involved in the management and the you know implementation of these processes within the company because at the end you're you're not part of the company you're the temporary help agency so the company is your client it's it's hard Hard to be on top of all these things and verify that your client 
which is the receiving company of the foreign worker, is complying with all these things. And you're the one who's going to be inspected as the temporary help agency. And you're the one who's at risk of fines, being banned from using the temporary foreign worker program, uh, reputational risks as well. So it's important before taking that decision to be the one who obtains the LMIA and the work permit as a temporary help agency that you're aware of you know the employer compliance obligations that come with that next slide please so i've mentioned this um already but again when we get an lmia the position the salary the work location all the conditions that the employment conditions declared in the lmia cannot be changed so an example of when it would be impractical or or increasingly risky for a temporary help agency to be the named employer and to be the one getting the LMIA is when the temporary help agency knows in advance that the foreign worker will be sent throughout the period of employment to many different client sites, to many different locations, and sometimes even to hold different job titles with different job tasks, even if they're similar, um, this is non-compliant. So if there's an, there's an inspection, um, you know, there's the the temporary help agency will be found non-compliant because they're not respecting um, the the employment conditions that were declared in the LMIA. And sometimes it's really hard to know in advance, you know, which clients are going to need, um, you know, your services. Um, so it's 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 impractical sometimes to know in advance all the work locations or all the job titles where you will send a temporary foreign worker. So in in this case, the best practice would, would be that the client employer or the receiving company be the one that applies for the LMIA and be the one that's responsible, um, you know, for all the obligations that come with hiring a foreign worker and applying for the LMIA. Um, next slide, please. So a little earlier, I mentioned that uh, technically a temporary help agency outside of, of Quebec would be able to subject to you know due diligence and and you know understanding the risks that come with it um would be able to be the named employer of an LMIA but in Quebec it's not the case um subsection 995 of the Quebec immigration regulation specifically states that the minister re will refuse the employer's application for an assessment of the labor market impact if the employer operates an enterprise whose activities consist in offering personnel placement and the employment offered is for providing a worker required to meet the temporary workforce needs of a client. So it's clear that Quebec doesn't favor these situations and it's it's the receiving company or the client employer that is required to obtain the LMIA and abide by all the uh, compliance rules that come with it. Next slide, please. So I keep mentioning, you know, employer compliance, um, the employer compliance regimes. So I wanted to briefly go over what this entails. What are we talking about when we're talking about employer compliance? And what are the risks com concretely if you are found to be non-compliant following an inspection? Next slide, please. So first off, it's important to know that when we're talking about employer compliance inspections, employer compliance inspections can take place starting from the first day of, the, of work of the foreign worker and up to six years following the first day. So this is why it's important to retain documents for a period of six years, any documents surrounding the employment of the foreign worker, and um, to document everything. It's important to know what your obligations as an employer are in advance, to document that you have complied with them, and to keep this documentation for a period of six years. Okay, thank you. So... One of the most common uh, compliance errors that we see surround recruitment fees, especially when dealing with temporary help agencies. Um, I think that um, maybe more recently, there's more awareness in terms of um, recruitment fees and the fact that um, employers are not to recover the fees for LMIA applications. 
um, or for the recruitment services that they've used in order to hire the foreign worker. Um, the immigration regulations specifically prohibit recovering these fees from the foreign worker. And it goes even further as to prohibit um, indirect recovery of these fees. So if we move along to the next slide, please. We can see that in addition to being prohibited of directly recovering, so the employer cannot directly recover recruitment fees from the foreign worker, but also they need to ensure that the placement or recruitment agencies that they're dealing with are not are also not recovering the fees pertaining to recruitment from their foreign workers. So this is an important uh, element to keep in mind. Next slide, please. And so some of the risks associated with non-compliance. So as mentioned earlier, um, you know, damage to the employer's reputation is, is one that comes up very often, um, sometimes for less serious cases or when it's the first instance of non-compliance, um, service can, well, the immigration authorities will, will issue a warning letter, um, but the warning letters are documented into the employer's file. So if there is a subsequent inspection and there is another instance of non-compliance, um, this will be considered an aggravating factor. And so the consequences will be even worse, um, the second time around or, you know, the subsequent times around. Um, Worse, even there's the uh, there could be a temporary or permanent ban um, from using the for a temporary foreign worker program or the international mobility program, and so this this is really problematic for uh, businesses that rely heavily on foreign workers. So you really don't want to be in a situation where you're banned from hiring foreign workers altogether. Um, and also there could be administrative monetary penalties of up to a hundred thousand per violation and up to a maximum of one million per year. So we can see why it's important to be aware of the um, obligations that we have as an employer, be it the temporary help agency or the employer, uh, the company directly, um, whoever is going to to be um, the named company on the LMIA and on the closed work permit. It's very important to understand these obligations and also to work together um, and to have mechanisms in advance to, to have an understanding of who's responsible of what to avoid surprises down the road. Next slide, please. This is just an example of, um, it, it, this is a public website on the government of Canada's website. Um, every time there is um, a ruling of non-compliance in terms of immigration rules, um, the company is published um, on this website um, and there is the penalty. And so, again, it, it all comes down to reputational risks. You don't want to be on this list. It's public. Anybody could see it. Um, and it just doesn't it doesn't look good. Next slide, please. So um, that's it for immigration um, in terms of temporary help. Um, so now I'll pass it back over to Shakila and she'll go over some of the key takeaways from Mark and Shakila as part of the presentation. And then I'll finish off with some key takeaways from an immigration law perspective. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, right off the get go, uh, another reminder that if you are planning to work with a temporary help agency, make sure that they have submitted their application for licensing by June 30th of this year. Um, that doesn't mean you have to stop working with them, but make sure that they're application is submitted and available for review by the Director of Employment Standards. So June 30th, that's the upcoming deadline. Um, next, based off the true and common employer factors that I touched on, make sure that um, the temporary help agency is the one that's assigning work to the assignment employees um, and has the control that um, of the assignment employee. That doesn't mean that as a client, you can't dictate what work needs to be performed, but ultimately make sure that the temporary help agency is the one that exercises fundamental control over the assignment employee. 
make sure that the temporary help agency is the one that pays their employees directly um, and responsible for disciplining their employees. The more control that you have over the assignment employees, the more you run the risk of being deemed a true or common employer with a temporary help agency. So it's important to bear that in mind if you are choosing to work with temporary workers and using the services of a temporary help agency. Uh, going back to the notion of perceived employer-employee relationship, the more control you exercise over an assignment employee, the more likely you are to be deemed a true or common employer. Uh, further to that, if the longer an assignment employee stays at your workplace, there is a greater risk of joint liability, which can be found under the Employment Standards Act um, in terms of unpaid wages. Um, and on top of that, um, we want to make sure that um, we are keeping in mind that the longer um, the assignment employee stays at the workplace, um, you are more likely to be deemed the true or common employer. So it's important to exercise cyclical um, um, assignment employees and make sure you're working with different ones at different times. Um, and now I'll pass it over to Stephanie to finish off with um, an immigration law perspective. Thanks, Shakila. So there are three uh, key takeaways from an immigration law perspective when dealing with temporary foreign workers. The main one being that before hiring a temporary foreign worker, even if you're doing it indirectly through a temp help agency, ensure that you request a copy of the work permit and that you understand the limitations of the work permit. Um, make sure you understand the difference between an open work permit and a closed work permit and document it. And don't, if you have any doubts about the validity of the work authorization, ask questions before moving forward. Um, also ensure that the temp help agency that you're dealing with understands Canada's immigration rules and employer compliance regimes, and that there's under, an understanding that those will be respected regardless of who will be the named employer on the LMIA and on the work permit. Um, ensure that the company, uh, you as well as the employer understands Canada's immigration rules and employer compliance obligations. And you know, have open discussions with the temp help agency that you're dealing with and have mechanisms in place, have things in writing um, to ensure that the temporary help agency is complying with immigration laws and, and vice versa. So if you're a temp help agency, you want, and you're the named employer, you want to make sure that you know, um, you know, how your client operates and you want to know that your client is going to be complying with both employment standards and immigration law rules. Um, and that, you know, you won't be held liable for non-compliances at the workplace from your client. Um, and then that's, that's really key to avoid any compliance risks. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'll jump in here. That's, uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, well, let's not go that far. Uh, we uh, we have some time right now. It's uh, just about quarter after. So we'll take a few questions. We've had lots roll in. So thanks, uh, everyone, for tuning in and being so active in our Q&A chat. Uh, all, all to say as we head into these questions, I think what you heard from me, from Shakila, from Stephanie, that you know, use, being a THA, using THAs uh, as a staffing solution, uh, there are a lot of great advantages uh, and there are risks. And so uh, I, I think as we move forward, you've got to keep in mind uh, what those are and make sure that we are doing our diligence in terms of who is being assigned, uh, how we're treating them, you know, whether we're a unionized environment or not, because those could have impacts on our bargaining units and who's in and who's not. Uh, and that we are following all of the legislative legal requirements. And as you know now, there are more of them coming in Ontario uh, to add to the existing regime in Ontario uh, come July. And it would surprise none of us to see some of these pieces get picked up elsewhere or copied elsewhere as we continue to move forward. So uh, with all that said, let's move into some of the questions and we'll try to do as many as we can. Um, you know, and if uh, if we miss any uh, apologies in advance, 
One of the questions we have uh, is with respect to Ontario again and the application fee for the new licensing regime, whether it's a one-time $750 fee or it's yearly, as of right now, it is expected to be a yearly fee. So expect that uh, each year you'll be paying the $750 uh, if you're a THA uh, in order to keep your license as you renew it. Another question we have, again, focused on the new rules, is do internal recruiters need a license as well? I know that we focused on THAs, but of course, this new regime is going to apply to recruiters as well. The answer there is no. There is a regulation exempting internal recruiters. So if they work for us and they're out there trying to find people to work for us, they do not need a license. It's not required. The folks who are caught are uh, organizations that operate simply as recruiters. That is, uh, you know, in the, in the clearest sense, their business model. You hire them to go recruit uh, candidates for employment uh, for you. So that their whole business model. It's the same thing when we look at temporary help agencies. I know that we've had some questions about what about secondments, et cetera. Uh, really the, the purpose, at least in Ontario, of the temporary help agency requirements is, you know, that is your business model. You exist to hire employees to have a ready pool of labor uh, that you can then send to a client. That is your business model. That is what you do. Being, a, being an organization that has a business model that has nothing to do with that, but sending one person, for example, on a secondment to a client or a potential client, that that is not the, the purposive uh, um, reason for all of these pieces. And, and uh, based on the legislation as we understand it today, you should not be caught by these uh, pieces. So you should not need a, a license to send somebody on a secondment. Uh, so hope that uh, is uh, helpful. Uh, Stephanie, I've got actually a question for you uh, that is interesting. Um, if, if we're working with a temporary help agency and we ask for a copy uh, of an assigned employee's work permit and the agency refuses, but we want that to ensure compliance, what, what may be our options here? Um, maybe you can comment a bit on that. Right. Um, so for sure, I would rely on Section 124 of the Immigration Act that states that any person who employs a foreign worker needs to verify that that person is legally authorized to work in Canada. So I would focus on the due diligence obligation. That's what I usually recommend. And obviously, privacy laws, a whole other issue. So, you know, if we really want to cover that aspect as well, for sure, we would need to verify with an expert in privacy laws. But when I'm talking about um, you know, the due diligence obligation from an immigration law perspective, that's my go-to. It's a requirement under the Immigration Act under Section 124. Great. Now, uh, Shaquille, we've got a question about joint liability uh, between a THA uh, and a client. And uh, maybe you could provide just another explanation of what, what happens if I'm the client uh, and whether that's in Ontario or whether I've risked a potential finding of, of being uh, the true employer or a, a joint or common employer in another province or jurisdiction, what's the potential outcome uh, if the THA, for example, doesn't pay the assignment employees? So what could potentially happen if the THA doesn't pay the assignment employees is that you as the client employer, along with other potential clients of the temporary help agency, could be on the hook for part or all of the unpaid wages due, um, due to the assignment employee. So if that assignment employee has also worked with other clients, they will also be jointly liable with you um, to pay those unpaid wages to the assignment employee. Right. But, uh, sticking with Ontario and the new rules coming in uh, July 1st, we have a couple more questions here uh, that I'm happy to answer. Uh, one question is with respect to the $25,000 letter of credit that's required to apply for the license, whether that is prorated to the size of the business involved, the THA business. And the answer there is, as of now, no, it is not. Uh, we've got another couple interesting questions uh, for folks 
who may be THAs that are based in Ontario, but not operating in Ontario, as in not placing employees within any jobs in Ontario, and whether the licensing requirement applies. That is a very interesting question, one which has not been interpreted yet by the Ministry of Labour. Uh, I would say, uh, given that this is new and novel um, legislation, there may be arguments uh, both ways. I would absolutely suggest that you get some legal advice if you're operating your THA out of Ontario, but not employing actual employees in Ontario, you're sending them to clients elsewhere. There may, there may be some risk involved, so to go ask. And the, and the same thing if you are a federally regulated employer, but you use THAs. Now, there is a high likelihood that the THA you're using is actually, you may be federally uh, regulated, but the THA may be provincially regulated. And so from a, a THA perspective, certainly these rules would apply to them. Whether or not uh, there will be some conflict uh, in jurisdiction going forward if you are the client that is federally regulated, uh, whether or not you can be penalized if you use an unregulated Ontario THA is, is an interesting question, one which has not been opined on yet by the Ministry of Labour. But I think these are issues that we may see come up. Now, if I am a federally regulated client, rather than provincially regulated, I think as a due diligence matter, it, using a, a THA in Ontario, I should ask without, without admitting any liability or admitting that I am provincially regulated for these purposes, I can ask for the license. And I think I should, especially after July 1st, if I'm going to use an Ontario THA, ask them for their licensing or proof that they have applied for a license, just as a matter of due diligence to avoid conflict and avoid any issues down the line. If they're licensed, then we never need to worry about that conflict point. Um, in uh, Stephanie, for you, uh, I've got a question here. Um, if uh, if we have an individual hired uh, on a postgraduate permit and it's close to expiring. Uh, is there a way to do an LMA after the fact, uh, since they're already working with us, or what would be the process there? Yeah, so for sure, um, we see this often actually because postgraduate work permits um, are good at the beginning because they're open, so it's easy to hire the foreign worker on the postgraduate work permit. Um, but then to extend it, oftentimes our clients will come to us and will need to apply for an LMIA. So there's no um, prohibition to obtain an LMIA just because the foreign worker had a different type of work permit and is already working for you. Um, so the answer is, you know, you can always help um, a foreign worker get a new work permit and you don't even have to wait for the current work permit to expire. Um, there are many reasons why certain foreign workers will prefer to have a closed work permit as opposed to an open work permit, interestingly enough. And sometimes we'll even go and ask their employers if they can help them, um, sponsor them to get a, a closed work permit, just to get the added benefits that come with it. Usually it's it's mostly tied to a provincial healthcare coverage that is granted to people with closed work permits and not granted to people with open work permits. So we th we see this change a lot, and it can happen uh, even before the open work permit expires or the other type of, even if it's a closed work permit, different category, it's always possible to obtain an L LMIA. Okay. Great. Uh, Shaquille, another another question. I'll, let, I'll send this to you in terms of the new regime coming in uh, and the obligation that uh, THAs in Ontario apply for their license by July 1st, and we know that the, the ministry may not be able to process and issue licenses in time for that. If I'm a client, uh, can I ask uh, the THA to provide some proof that they applied before the deadline? And if so, what sort of proof might be helpful? Um, I believe that as a client, you can ask and obtain proof from the THA that you're working with, whether or not they've applied um, for a license uh, with the Director of Employment Standards. And um, after the fact, and as um, the director starts um, 
providing and handing out these licenses to the THAs, there's actually going to be an online database that clients can consult to determine whether or not the THA that they work with um, has obtained a license. So that's going to be convenient for any prospective client employers who are looking to work with agencies to just log on and determine if the agency they're looking and hoping to work with is licensed with the Director of Employment Standards. Um, but in the meantime, and while we await these licenses uh, to start um, coming out, um, it seems um, reasonable to ask the temporary help agency that you're working with whether or not they've applied for a license in the meantime. I think that's right. And re recall that uh, as a client, you are obligated to make sure you're not using an unlicensed THA after July 1st. So do your diligence. Uh, if they say they don't have their license yet, ask for their proof of application uh, and the date they applied. Um, we want to take uh, one or two more questions here uh, before we wrap. Uh, this one for uh, Stephanie, do you, can you comment a bit on whether or not there are caps for 2024 on the number of temporary foreign workers permitted into Canada? So that's another hot topic now in the news. Um, yesterday, uh, the government announced caps on for study permits for international students. Um, and there are talks of caps for um, work permits as well, foreign workers coming into Canada. Um, so... We need to stay tuned for the, for those changes. Hasn't been uh, confirmed as of yet, um, but it's important to keep in mind, nonetheless, that there are some work permit categories that have caps. Just the program itself, um, one of them being the International Experience Canada program that is popular for employers. So the young professional work permit or even the, the working holiday, those are subject to caps every year. So every year there's a number of limited spots um, where foreign workers can apply under that those streams. And then once they're capped, you need to wait till the following year to reapply. So then, you know, if that was your plan to get a work permit for the foreign worker candidate that you're, you know, that you're you're targeting, then you know, you need to have a plan B and find another work permit category in case that one's capped in the process. Great. Th thanks, Stephanie. And then I'll do one last question. And I'll, I'll, I'll take this. There's a question about can the government or, or Ministry of Labor, uh, in our case, uh, and I'll, I'll speak to Ontario, can they come and inspect the client in the event there is a, an issue with the THA, the uh, temporary help agency that they're using? The answer to that is yes. Uh, they have uh, broad discretion built into our legislation, yes, for the ministry to come and inspect the client, make sure the client is complying with all the various rules uh, Shaquilla mentioned, and more. There are, there are additional rules and obligations on clients. You use temporary help agencies in the province. Uh, and come July 1st, there will be the additional ability to inspect whether or not uh, we have uh, knowingly used an unlicensed THA or recruiter. So record keeping as with everything we do as employers, uh, whether that's uh, making sure we're compliant with immigration issues, uh, with uh, labor issues, with employment issues, it's key. Document it, keep tabs, know what you are required to keep, know how long you are required to keep it. And if you've got those documents, uh, when you call your favorite Faskin lawyer, uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be e even, uh, even more expedient in helping you out as we figure out uh, what the government is looking for and how to respond to any inquiries uh, for information or documentation. So document, document, document. I feel like you get that from us in every single presentation that we give you. Uh, but with that said, uh, that will bring our, our uh, presentation today to a close. Uh, as you see on the last page, and we've had it up for a while, uh, we have a link to a survey. Uh, maybe we can go go back to that link. If you haven't uh, clicked on it already, uh, you can put your your phone up and QR code that like we've done for so many years on menus. We've taken this online so you can do our survey from your phone uh, going forward. Uh, and I want to uh, thank you for taking the time to fill that out, for helping us with our future sessions uh, and ideas on what we do. I want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Stephanie and uh, Shaquilla, who's just now wrapped her first uh, presentation. And in the background, uh, our, our webcast hosts uh, and a couple more of our colleagues, Will and Andrea, for all their assistance 
uh, putting this presentation together today. Uh, if, uh, if you haven't got it yet, uh, please take a look in your inbox or you haven't RSVP'd yet, take a look in your inbox. Our next Labour and Employment and Human Rights session is going to be on February 14th, Valentine's Day, uh, on the topic of investigations. What a timely day to do it. Now, if you haven't already signed up, you can do so on Faskin.com under the Faskin Institute section. Uh, with that said, from here at the team at Faskin, we wish you a, a, a great, uh, great Tuesday, wherever you are. Uh, stay warm, stay safe in the snow, and we'll catch you again on February 14th.